thinking for this month. Last month, we didn't have any because it was a holiday. Go figure. Every once in a while, there is a holiday. Again, I want to welcome everyone and so glad you're here today to join us to get some information and uh, so that we can share what's going on in the tier three world. I'm going to now turn it over to Chad. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, so here's our agenda for today's meeting. Uh, first, we're going to start out and do some introductions uh, to introduce the tier three team. Uh, we have a special guest joining us today, Teresa Roberts, um, who's the coordinator for the state operated behavior and crisis services. Um, and she's going to give us an overview today on state operated programs. Uh, we're going to talk about the behavior support review committee and uh, give you guys a, a vision of what the invitation process looks like. Uh, we'll hear from our subject matter experts on updates. Uh, in the areas of training, the Behavior Support Review Committee, and also prohibited practices. Uh, we'll do some general Tier 3 reminders, and then uh, we'll have some time for a little Q&A, and then we will wrap up. All right, so starting out with introductions, um, at the top we've got our Chief Behavior Analyst of the State, Dr. Lucas Evans. Um, and he is not uh, on the call with us today or, or else I'd ask him to say hey to everybody. Um, and then moving on from there, uh, we'll just go across the state starting in the Eastern region. Our area behavior analyst for the Eastern region is Melantha Witherspoon. Uh, Melantha, would you like to say hi? Hello, happy Monday everyone. Great for you guys joined. Thanks Melantha. And then her counterpart in the Eastern region, the intensive systems consultant, is Cindy Hannabrink. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad you could join us. Thanks, Cindy. And then moving on to the central region, our area behavior analyst for the central region is Cindy McDonald, um, which she is not currently with us in this meeting. Uh, and then myself is the ISC for the central region, Chad Reyes. And then moving on to the western region, our area behavior analyst is Ms. Rita Cooper. Hey, happy Monday, everyone. Thanks, Rita. And her counterpart, the intensive systems consultant is Kay Hamblin. Hi, everyone. Glad to have you here today. Thanks, Kay. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we also will have a special guest joining us today, Teresa Roberts. Hi, everyone. This is Teresa. Thanks for having me. Okay, ready for me to take it over, Chad? You can take control, Teresa. All right. Um, so I am the coordinator of crisis and behavior services for state operated programs. So I was here just to talk um, briefly about our state operated programs and about crisis services offered within state operated programs. So for those of you who are not familiar with what our state operated programs are, uh, we have state operated habilitation centers. Those are facilities in which individuals are receiving 24 hour support in a congregate setting. Uh, they're certified as intermediate care facilities. So they have ICF certification um, serving individuals with developmental disabilities and the folks there who are getting those long term supports at our habilitation centers are certified through the Department of Health and Senior Services for those supports. So it's a different, um, a different method of payment and kind of a different service system than the Medicaid waiver service system is. Uh, we provide a variety of services at the state operated habilitation centers um, and the supports vary based on the need of the individual, but there is residential supports to everyone um, and then nursing supports, employment supports, occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, behavior analysis, all of those, you know, depending on the person's needs. Um, we have several habilitation centers remaining in the state. Uh, in St. Louis, there is St. Louis Developmental Disability Treatment Center, often called DDTC. There are actually two locations for that habilitation center. There's the St. Charles DDTC location and the South County DDTC location. Also in St. Louis, we have Bell Fountain Habilitation Center. Um, 
And then it, moving into the southern part of the state, we have Seymour's, which is Southeast Missouri Residential Services. That also has two different locations, one in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, and one in Sykeston. And then we have the Higginsville Habilitation Center in Higginsville, Missouri. So as far as who receives services in our state operated habilitation centers, we have no new admissions to the habilitation centers um, since 2007. Habilitation centers remain open. Everybody who is living in a habilitation center has been given the option to move into the community. The folks that remain in the habilitation centers long term are the folks whose guardians have chosen for them to continue to live there. Um, and so they will be able to continue to live there, but no new residents can be admitted. Uh, this all stems from a DOJ agreement from 2007 that stopped new admissions in order to make sure that we are compliant with Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the finding of the Olmstead de decision, which says that we need to be providing community-based services for individuals. Um, so again, that's why we stopped having, as a state, people moving into the habilitation centers and prioritizing instead services in the community. So uh, while those individuals that we continue to serve will still live there, we don't do any new admissions unless, uh, and the only, the only people that we have coming in are people who are coming in only short term for crisis services. And again, those aren't considered admissions because it's just considered a short term service with the goal of the person then returning to the community setting. To be eligible for crisis services in our state operated programs, um, we are serving individuals who are 18 years of age. Uh, you have to have a de de developmental disability diagnosis, have an open case with the local regional office. Um, and right now we are prioritizing those people who have been approved for residential services with a comprehensive waiver slot. Um, with specific focus on the current criteria is people who are in an unsafe living situation, and that is kind of defined as people who are currently boarding at hospitals. So the hospital has deemed the person ready for discharge to go back into the community, but the person has no safe place to be discharged to, or they are awaiting release from jail or homeless. Those are the criteria of the folks since we have such a limited um, availability. We have very few spots that we're able to serve people within state operated programs. Um, and so those are the individuals who are being prioritized for the for access to those services. Um, as far as the referral process, um, there, there used to be a referral process. So people might be familiar with the old referral process, but we changed that a while back. Um, and we are currently do not need to actually, there's no need for anybody to send a referral whenever the person is in need of crisis services. There's no need for anybody to be doing all of that paperwork, trying to gather information um, whenever there's may or may not be a chance of actually getting in, depending upon the availability of our openings and how many people are needing services. So rather than having lots of teams um, put all of that time and effort into collecting all of that paperwork on the front end. Instead, we are monitoring, the division is monitoring um, individuals who are in need and who meet those criteria that we just outlined. Um, and then whenever there's an opening within our program or a projected opening within our program, I would be reviewing the list of the individuals that are in need. Um, and then based on that, based on the length of the time that the person's been on need and the compatibility of the individual with a particular um, possible opening, um, those would be the candidates for the services. Um, so whenever we get to that point that we have a possible opening, I'd be looking at those individuals who are in need, um, reaching out to those teams and asking for more information at that time. And then it would be at that time that we're ready to kind of move forward with looking at a particular person that we might ask the, the team to actually gather all of that information that used to be in a referral packet. Teresa, can I add something real quick? Yes, go ahead. Um, so while there isn't a referral form anymore, there are a couple things that you really need to keep in mind. So Teresa's right that we're we're monitoring the needs, but we're doing that through our established system. So that means make it's going to be critically important that the EMT system is used when it's when it's needed. So when there are reportable events, that those get in there because that's part of our data. If there's an emergency placement situation that's described in the transition policies and procedures, that that's being followed. Um, that when a 30 day notice is given that that that's part of the, the process so you're entering that information because that those are all of the data sources that we use to identify who's of greatest need. Um, and there are sometimes some weird situations that come up that we end up having an email about that was a legitimate fall through the cracks, but in 99% of the 
situations where there's a person with a great need that we didn't know there was a great need, it was a lack of use of those established systems. So there aren't EMTs in the system that would let us know that there's a lot of serious behavior happening. The uh, emergency placement process isn't being used. An agency's kind of given a 30-day notice, but not formally. And so that system's not being utilized or they're filling out the red cap form. So if none of those things are happening, it's impossible for us to know there's a need. So this actually creates less work for everyone if we can just use the systems that we have and then Teresa can generate a list of who's up most need when she has um, uh, openings. So it really creates efficiencies for everyone. Even though it seems like it's less available, it's actually more available because we can only fo we can focus on it when it's actually a real choice and not have teams doing a ton of extra work when it's not a real choice. Yes, thanks for that addition, Lucas. Okay, and then the last kind of component is that um, within state operated programs, and I know it can be confusing because we have some different names, um, but Optimistic Beginnings is a program that is part of state operated programs. It's a little different than some of our other crisis programs. It's a program that's based on dialectical behavioral therapy, and because of that, um, individuals must have moderate verbal skills in order to participate. Um, it's the most restrictive DD state operated crisis program, and so it's certainly not avail uh, not appropriate for every person. Um, and, but the referral system for that is now the same as what we just described for other state operated program crisis services. So we're still going to be monitoring those individuals using all of those systems that Lucas was just referencing. Um, and then when we have a need and optimistic beginnings, um, we would be determining who would be a good fit based on those criteria. Thank uh, that's thanks. the last slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you both uh, Teresa and Lucas. Um, Teresa for that abundant information and Lucas for those great ads. And uh, we're going to pass it on to uh, Kay Hamblin to talk a little bit about the uh, invitation process for the Behavior Support Review Committee. We done. Thanks, Teresa, for the awesome explanation um, all, as well. So um, when you think about invitation, you think about like something coming in the mail or, or a call or something coming in email or whatever. So this comes via email. Um, we call it an invitation because there is an attendance letter or invitation letter attached to it. So um, the team will be identified by our team, the team being the support team for the individual. The individual is determined as eligible to come to behavior support review committee based on several factors, which we'll look into here shortly. Um, and they're, they're based on the CSR and the guidelines. So you'll get an encrypted email. It'll always be encrypted because it's going to contain a lot of HIPAA information. It's going to contain the, contain the individual name, possibly their DMH number. It's going to contain their support person's names, um, you know, things like that. So it'll come encrypted. It'll come with a date, a time, and information to call in. So when you get this, it'll say, dear planning team, so-and-so has been identified as meeting that criteria. The team has been scheduled on this date at this time. It's going to say attached to this email, you will find a formal invitation letter and planning team information. That's probably one of the most important sentences in there is that there are attachments and you'll see those four little attachments there and I'll go into those in a moment. Um, and, and and that's just really critical that that you open them. <laughs> so it's kind of like getting a birthday gift. You have to open the whole thing to see what's inside. And it, it tells what we need. It identifies then how to send it to the BSRC email. Um, it also asks that each person could fill out what we call a case review form and a referral form. So um, we do our best to provide information that we have based on what Seymour has of who the provider is, if it's, if it's a residential provider. Um, and we put a name in there if we can, if there's a name attached to it in Seymour. We also include the um, social services uh, specialists or the so service coordinator supervisor um, and the board that they are identified with. If there's a behavior provider, we put that person in there and then whoever the guardian is, whether that's a um, 
public appointed person or whether it's a parent or a grandparent or an aunt and uncle, whoever, or if the individual is their own guardian, we identify that as well. And then sometimes there are people that are involved with our individual's lives that we just don't have their name or their email address or anything like that. So you'll see that that bottom yellow, it says, please share the invitation and information with all team, I, with the team identified above, as well as extended planning team identified in the attachment. So um, if there are, like say, if there are other individuals, maybe there's a day program person, maybe there's a psychiatrist or psychologist who would, who would be good to come to this meeting, a primary care doctor, a, a special nurse that that individual works with that can help explain what's been going on, why all of the EMTs have come in for this behavior or for this health reason or, or whichever. Um, so it's important when you receive this email, if you can help us out, we just greatly appreciate it. Okay, next slide, Rita, please. This is what the um, join the meeting looks like. So if you see the green box there in the meeting, middle where it says join the meeting, that's how you can join a WebEx. You just click on that and it'll take you into the WebEx system. If you're unfamiliar with the WebEx system, you can call in on a phone and um, the number is down below. And then if it asks for an access code or a meeting code, that's all printed right there if you need any of that. Sometimes uh, people aren't able to be by their computer. Um, if we've got people traveling, they want to join, but they just can't, so that they'll call in by phone. And that's perfectly acceptable. Just know that if any documents are shared on the screen that you won't be able to see them um, or see them as well on your phone. And we typically don't share documents, but um, on occasion. So next, Rita. So again, that identifies those documents, those attachments. So A is says, what is um, the BSRC tier three? What it is our what factor? When, when you're invited, what to expect? C is the invitation letter and D is the case review and referral form. And those may come in different, uh, different. Um, they may not come exactly how they're identified there. The attachments just pop up there, however we put them in. So. So A is what is the BSRC team? What what do you, why why are we coming here? What's going on? So um, it gives a brief information about what the behavior support review committee is. It um, tells you who is on the committee, which is um, the folks that were identified here today, um, including Sin, who's not with us today, and sometimes Lucas is on there with us as well. It's also all of those folks that we have asked for, asked to attend in that invitation, that email invitation. And it's the other ones that possibly you identify as needing to come. So it also tells when we have our sessions and um, those links that are in there, they say join here, those are live links. And if you are um, a DMH employee on the call today, and you just would like to attend just to hear what it's all about. Maybe you're a nurse or you work for provider relations or in the accounting department or whatever. You know, you can just, hey, you know, pop in on that and, and listen because you never know what you might learn. Um, the last one is probably the biggest one. We, we get questions back. Why am I coming? How is this individual selected? You know, He's been doing really well. Mac hasn't had any behaviors in 14 days and we just think he's doing fabulous. Well, as we know, sometimes data runs slower than our systems are moving or then the individual makes changes. So like right now we are doing imitations for say August, but the data we're reviewing is coming from like March and April. So, Yes, that seems like a long time ago, but in, in the world of data collection, that's not that long ago. So, um, and we identify these uh, reasons in our letters, and sometimes we identify them in the email as well. So, some of the reasons are significantly challenging behaviors, um, a reactive strategy threshold that's been met, having um, X amount of psychotropic medications or PRN used for behavior control, 
sometimes there are self referrals. Um, um, someone will send a message to us. Hey, I've got this going on. Can we get in with you all? And we were like, yeah, you know, we'll get you in. There are uh, also prohibited procedures that maybe are in place um, that we review and receiving intensive therapeutic therapeutic residential habilitation services. That one, I believe, is going to be going away from our committee, but in the past, that has been included as well. Next, Rita. So when you're invited, um, so again, it goes over the top. What factors are there? Um, the attendance notification, what all is included? Um, what the expectations are for the required material and attendance. So those identified in the letter and in the email are the ones that we would really, really, really like to attend. Though so those those are the folks that were we're counting on being there as being a support system for that individual. Um, Filling out the case review form, if we can get one of those filled out by a, the folks that we've identified as coming as a support team, each person, that'd be great because everybody sees the supports for that individual may be a little bit different. Maybe the guardians are seeing, well, on the weekends when Mac is at home, I, we have to support him like this, this, this. But when he's at his ISL during the week, they don't support him like that. So, you know, where are the differences at? Things like that. Those are all things that can add to behaviors and can add to to problems and, and things like that. You'll also get a reminder um, sent throughout basically the same process um, that, that the meeting is coming up and um, you can always send back um, a response. Hey, I'm not able to come, but my supervisor is coming in my place. Or um, if I'm the owner or the director of an agency, maybe my program manager or my frontline people are going to come in, instead of me because I don't work with Mac every day. So, so the day of the meeting, uh, we'd like you to, to log in on the day and the time that you have been invited to come. We will do a welcome. We'll set the expectations, introductions of the committee members and the team that has come. Sometimes we'll ask like the service coordinator to introduce everyone. It's just sometimes a little bit easier and quicker. Um, well, the summary presentation, you know, what's going on? What, what supports do you all feel you need? Uh, can you, can you just say, you know, he's got X, Y, Z behavior and we've tried this and we just don't know what to do or, or these things are happening, eloping or, um, well, yeah, we do use a gate in our house because he doesn't understand that being in the kitchen is a bad thing on and on. It could be a number of things. So, um, and then we'll open up the dialogue. We'll open up uh, some questioning. We'll do round robin questioning of, from the committee, and then we'll assign some recommendations, things that, that the, the committee has found may be helpful for the team to try or um, to look into or um, have some evaluations done, things like that. After the meeting, um, within about five to seven business days, you're going to get a summary from the behavior analysts, which will be Sin, Melantha, or Rita, or one of, or one of the three of us ISCs, um, Cindy, myself, Kay, or Chad, and it's going to say this is the this is what led you all to coming to meet with us, and these are the recommendations that we find um, that pertain to the situations that for the individual. Um, there will be time frames on there for completing these. Um, also, then within usually within about 10 to 12 to 14 business days after that, um, Chad or Cindy, Cindy or myself will send out an action plan uh, template for you to use if you choose. And if you choose not to, that's fine too. It's just something to help organize those recommendations. It's something that you can build on, you can change. We're just offering you a template to use from. And then there will be a follow up coaching and support. So we will do email follow ups or phone call follow ups and say, hey, you know, how are you coming on those? Are you having any problems? Oh, you can't get a hold of that service provider. Let me see if I can find a better number for you. Um, 
you're having troubles implementing one of the recommendations, you know, whatever. And we can set up WebExes for all of us to talk, or we can um, talk via email, how whatever is most comfortable for the team and, and most efficient for the team to do. Right, next slide, please, Rita. So this is what the actual invitation attendance letter looks like. It's dated, it says the individual's name, their DMH number, it says why they're coming under its, um, I don't know if it's small on your end, it's smaller on my end, but it says his first name, his name, and then it says it, says it again in the second line, then in the third line, um, and, there, and the support team are required to attend Behavior Support Review Committee. Max Smith met the criteria of having psych psychotropic medications or PRN used for behavior control. So right there in that first paragraph is going to tell you why your individual and why you all have been asked, quote unquote, required to come to Behavior Support Review Committee. And it is a requirement because it is in the CSR and it is, there is a guideline regarding about it. And it does state that right there in the very first sentence that CSR um, 945.3.0090 is the CSR. And we can attach that as well. And we have attached that in, to the invitation in the past. Um, but we can gladly send that out to you if, if you would like to see that or if you're having trouble locating it. Um, so it, it states that in there. It tells you again your day and your time. Uh, it gives you the phone number and then the access code. I didn't put one in there. And then it also, the other that's important there is it says that we will need your information back to us by a certain date. Okay. It's usually about um, two to three weeks, 21 days, roughly before the individual is going to come to behavior support review community. Now I say the individual is coming. The individual is more than welcome to attend. However, if it's going to cause, um, hardship for the team, or if it's going to cause that individual to feel bad or anything with them, no, we don't, we don't want that to happen. Um, and if the individual is on the call with us, by all means, we will um, we will be very respectful as it as we always are, um, and we will be very encouraging of that individual. So, but it's asking for information. So the information that we need um, is the ISP, a BSP, a behavior support plan, if there is one, a safety crisis plan, if there is one. Um, information from the behavioral provider, information from the residential provider. Again, that's in that uh, referral form, which you'll, or review and referral form, which you'll see here in a moment. Um, and then if there are any people who have not been identified in the email as the support team, so say we missed um, a day, day programming person that's really important in this individual's life, or that's where the individual is having the hard time, please let us know. Shoot us a message and say, hey, you need to invite so-and-so and here's their email. We'll send it right out to them. It also tells you how to reply back and how to send the information. And it tells you the individual's name, that are sending it out. So it'll be sent from myself, Chad or Cindy, and then with a behavior provider attached to it as well. And even though we are designated for three different areas in the state, it doesn't mean that we specifically and only work in that area. So I'm partnered with Rita because we're on the Western region and Chad with Sin and Cindy with Melantha. That doesn't mean that I won't or can't work with Sin or Melantha or, or Cindy can't work with Rita, whatever. So. Don't always think that you're going to get a letter from the team from in the area that you're in, because we we just pick and choose names and go down the list and, and assign. So okay. next slide. So this is the case review form or a referral form. Um, 
pretty basic questions. Um, Rita's made it really easy on this form. You just have to click and, and fill it in um, who you are, the planning team member, um, what, you know, what your role is and your name, the email address, phone number, um, you know, what's your biggest behavioral concern? What's the frequency or duration of the behavior of the behaviors of concern? Do you have a current safety crisis plan? All of these things are going to be very crucial information that we receive ahead of time. So that way we don't have to take time in the meeting asking that. So, and on down the list, and then if like I say, if everyone that has been invited can fill that out and send it back to us, that's amazing. And um, I noticed Lucas has put in the, in the chat that the BSRC will continue to review the intensive therapeutic residential habilitation per the service definition for the time being. Thank you, Lucas, for reminding us about that. And I do I have another one, Rita? I think that's it. All right. Well, um, we're going to pass it on. Um, thank you, Kay, for going through the invitation and the elements of that. It's um, hopefully adds clarity for everyone about how the process works. Um, we're going to pass it on next to um, our subject matter experts and we're going to start with training in Melantha. So Melantha, this is your slide. Awesome. Happy Monday, everyone. Um, we have finished our trainings for the 2023 fiscal year. There were approximately um, 17 trainings. We averaged 14 people uh, in most of those trainings. Trainings will resume again in September, probably the middle to end part of September. We haven't gotten uh, a start date yet. Um, in July, if you are a uh, person who provides ABA services, um, to folks who receive funding from us, you should see, receive a survey to complete. So you can give us feedback about the types of trainings you want to, uh, participate in if you're delivering ABA services. And, um, our goal is to make, um, very, uh, meaningful training, continuing education opportunities based on information that we receive from those ABA service providers who attend. So that's what I have. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone again, this is Chad here. I'm gonna go ahead and fill in for SIN uh, on the prohibited practices updates. Uh, so we, we just had a few uh, for this month and one of those is that we we do have an operational and um, up and running mailbox uh, for prohibited practices. So if there are any inquiries, uh, concerns, referrals uh, regarding prohibited practices, please uh, shoot us that information to that mailbox. Uh, the email address for that is prohibitedpractice at dmh.mo.gov and I will Put that in the chat box uh, here in just a minute too. Um, another thing is that we're asking uh, folks to please include uh, ISPs and or PSPs uh, whenever you are shooting um, potential prohibited practices to that email. Um, that will help us decrease the amount of time uh, that it takes for us to uh, review that case and, and make a determination on whether or not it's a prohibited practice. Because um, if not, if we don't have that information, then we're, we will email back and reach out and request it. Um, and then so that inevitably will just delay the time. Uh, another thing is want to let you know that our internal team is meeting uh, at least at least twice a month to review cases and determine whether or not they are prohibited. Um, and after the review is conducted, uh, if a potential prohibited practice is determined that it is prohibited, then it will be referred to the Behavior Support Review Committee. Um, and for that, 
it's a, uh, a special session that we have to review prohibited practices specifically, and that happens uh, the fourth Wednesday of every month. And Rita, I believe that's uh, that's all the updates that we've got this month for prohibited practices. Okay, great. Thanks, Chad. And so we we had a nice session about the invitation, but I wanted to give a couple other updates about the behavior support review committee. Um, we do uh, want to get your feedback, and we're always on a a path of continuous improvement, and we evidence that by the survey we send out to attendees and the survey we send out to committee members. Um, we have a stable committee uh, cohort, um, and so based on um, wanting to have an actual dialogue, we will be having what I call a committee member uh, town hall um, which will be this coming Wednesday. Um, and so all of the committee members have gotten the invitation and the idea is that we will actually be able to sit and chat with folks for about a half hour, 45 minutes to see, you know, actually what's going on. Do they like what's going on? What about the, the checklist and the review process? Um, could we make some improvements on? Um, we have made changes as we've grown. Of course, we've got a new case review form. We're working on updating the uh, invitation letter. So it, it's a little more um, pleasing to the eye. Of course, we've added the uh, one page informational um, product to identify what is committee, how is committee. And as Kay said, um, and as we mentioned before, the committee is an open forum, so um, anyone is welcome to listen in to learn and grow. So I am going to hand it off to um, Cindy to give us some general reminders. Thank you, Rita, and good afternoon, everyone. Happy Monday. So uh, some general reminders. Uh, for with the tier 3 team, um, here's a, a quick overview of where to go to if you have questions uh, related to any prohibited practice as uh, Chad was talking about earlier. Uh, if you suspect a prohibited practice, um, you have any questions about guideline 85 or the CSR related to prohibited practices, you will go to the prohibited practice at dmh.mo.gov. And I believe that was also put into the chat box earlier. Um, for any questions regarding uh, behavior support review committee, uh, anything related to that, you may have a, if there's a question uh, about guideline 84 or the CSR related to behavior support review committee, Maybe you need to make a behavior support review uh, referral or any materials that are related to attending the behavior support review committee. Those can all be sent to the email here, bsrc at dmh.mo.gov. And then uh, are uh, any general other tier three questions you may have, you can direct them to our bat. Um, at at dmh.mo.gov email. And then there's also our personal emails too. You could feel free to reach out to any one of us here on, on the team and we'll be happy to respond back and help you. Okay, and then here's some more general reminders as far as uh, what we do on the, you know, the tier three team. Um, so, first of all, our goal is more than just the compliance, and we do that by building capacity for our residential providers, our behavior providers, uh, sport coordinators, regional office staff. We also want to work across the aisle or alongside with Department of Behavioral Health, DBH. 
for example, they may call on us when they have a question around a prohibited practice or a rights restriction that might be a prohibited practice. We also collaborate with our other tier one and tier two teams. Uh, for example, this fall, we'll be collaborating with the tier two team on the safety crisis plan training workshops and also on the upcoming comprehensive planning tool workshops. We work to build resources for our supporting teams. We've also worked to provide access to trainings. As um, Melantha was talking about earlier, we recently had some really good trainings for our behavior providers, and those will be starting up again soon. Um, and also, we are working to build uh, Relias modules for how to do or how to write a safety crisis plan. And we're working for on uh, writing Relias modules for um, the comprehensive planning tool. So, and then, of course, uh, last but not least, we also work to provide consultation uh, when it is needing. You know, we don't. Um, we don't just provide individually, but uh, we work with teams to help them build their overall capacity to serve those individuals with complex needs. So uh, basically, in a nutshell, that's just kind of some quick reminders. And Rita, I believe I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Cindy, for those great general reminders. Again, our goal is to build capacity. Um, and the only way that the um, system grows is by building that capacity. So I wanted to move on to the Q&A part and I'm uh, searching through the chat here. Um, Kay is helping to get the referral form to Ruth. Thank you very much for reaching out. Um, the case review form is also the referral form that we use. So, you know, we don't need duplicates when uh, one will do the job for both um, elements of what we do for the behavior support review committee. Um, Candace asks, what is the turnaround time for questions um, that are sent into the prohibited practice um, email box, I believe is probably what you were asking. Uh, you know, we try to get to those within a, a day or so of them entering into the prohibited practice um, email, then they are assigned to an area behavior analyst. If it's just a, a situational issue, then um, we have to gather ISPs, we have to call and ask questions. So it may be a, a bit of time anywhere from, gosh, uh, a week to 10 days, if not longer, um, because we need the information to kind of look through to determine, is it truly a prohibited practice? Um, once the determination is made, then there are other elements, of course, we have to identify the um, regional office. So the turnaround time is always contingent on the amount of information we get in the prohibited practice email that was sent. And I know that's not a clear question, clear answer, but, uh, you know, it's all contextual based on what's going on and the amount of information that we receive. And uh, Candace, did that kind of answer your question a little bit? Um, you are more than welcome to um, email the prohibited practice um, email box, and I'm sure Sin and or Chad can get back to you with a little more information in regards to that. Or if there is a specific case, you can always email the prohibited practice um, email to ensure that, uh, you know, we're addressing um, a particular situation. And we're going to sit in silence just for a little bit for people to kind of digest. We had a lot of rich information this afternoon and there may be some.
questions related to that, or there may be some other questions. So um, be prepared for awkward silence. I'm not seeing any additional information in the, the chat with any questions. Um, wanted to open the floor to my associates to see if they have anything they'd like to add to our discussion uh, this afternoon. Um, any elements that we may have missed. And so we're going to kind of wrap it up and uh, give a reminder that our next informational meeting will be um, 7-31-2023. Yeah, we've had a couple questions pop in there. I popped one in there as well, just asking. Um... Ms. Lucas, I can answer Carrie's question. So the question from Carrie Myers is how many individuals are on the wait list for state operated crisis, such as OB? Um, and the answer again to that question is there isn't a wait list. Uh, Currently, when state operated has capacity to accept somebody, they look at who's of greatest need. I can give you some numbers about who currently in the state on who has the greatest need. So uh, the uh, uh, we we have a terminology called red hot situations that are the most severe. And as of right now, or as of I think two days ago, there were 22 of those situations in the state and maybe more now. Uh, there's probably nearly 50 emergency placement, maybe more than 50 actually. Uh, emergency placement situations, there's about seven to 800 people that are actively looking for residential services that can't find it. So it's a pretty large list of folks that are um, uh, in great need. Um, of those 50, 50 plus people that are in need of emergency placement, um, probably half of those people are currently either in the hospital or jail or homeless. Um, so uh, that that's kind of the list that Therese is looking at when they have capacity. And if I think maybe the question you might be asking is, do we feel like it's sufficient um, as far as the amount of capacity that we have? And I think everybody would agree that no, the, the capacity issue is a problem, that we don't have enough of it. Um, but I think the other thing that we need to think about is um, uh, we as a system need to do better at intervening earlier in the upstream rather than um, having all these downstream crisis situations, because we're never going to be able to build enough capacity to support um, 700 people that really are legitimately in a crisis. If you if you need a new place to live and you can't find a service provider, you're kind of in a pickle. Um, so we're, we're never going to have enough capacity to address all those people if we don't start trying to get a little bit farther upstream and start reducing the number of people that get down there. But yes, you're right. We don't have enough capacity to stay operated. So um, we're working on it. And I just let Mandy know, Mandy, if you have a particular scenario, um, it probably would be best to reach out to one of us. And I put my number in the chat. And if you can give me a call um, when we're finished, that would be great. So Rita, um, uh -huh. what, what's the best way um, for people to get that referral form um, that we that we've can, spoke about? Um, the referral form for the Behavior Support Review Committee, if you just email the BSRC at dmh.mo.gov and say, I would like a referral form, then we will send it to you. Thank you.
are you asking for phone numbers or are you asking? I'm not sure what you're asking, Ruth. I, I think she's asking for the numbers of people on this list. And oh, I don't okay. think we have a publicly posted list of those numbers, but if you would like to, you can check out this news article that was in the News Tribune, Jeff City News Tribune, about this issue, which cites some numbers. I, it's not just about children in foster care. It also talks about the numbers for folks in IDD. <clears throat> Might be a couple more questions, so we'll j wait just a bit. A wrap for this session. And uh, so again, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, this afternoon, and we'll see you at the end of July and have a great 4th and be safe.